Tell me when. Um, give me a second. Okay, you're, you're off. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this really good two credit of oh, 1.5 credit, 0.5 ethics credit on avoiding real property disputes and divorce matters. My name is Margaret Lang, and some of you, a lot of you know me. I am the development director for the Asian American Bar Association of New York. I am the co-chair of the Real Estate Committee, and I'm senior uh, underwriting counsel in the title insurance industry at Big Apple Abstract. Uh, we've been wanting to do this topic for a long time, and we work really hard to plan this, and we appreciate you finding the time today. I know it's beautiful outside, sunny day, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy the panelists that we have uh, speaking with us today. Um, this is a, an event that's going to be from two. We should be done by four o'clock. Um, and I just wanted to make sure I acknowledge the right people. I will read the administrative uh, requirements after I do a, a very quick introduction. Uh, the co-sponsors, one of them is the Asian American Bar Association of New York, of which I've been a member for 13 years. I want to encourage any of you that on this call, and we do have a lot of people attending today, please join the Asian Bar. It's www.abony.org. We have great events. I do about 16 to 20. I've transitioned to webinar. You'll see me like every week. I go onto the website. I have a great real estate event on Monday interviewing heavy hitters in the real estate industry. And then on Tuesday on the Local Law Climate Mobilization Act. In July, I've got an event on uh, remote residential and commercial closings. And I know everybody wanted to know about that. I will actually, um, that will be on July 9th, on July 16th, diversity inclusion. And I know all of you need the, your DNI credits. And on July 17th, an ethics on cyber fraud and security, cyber fraud and, and deed fraud. And that's coming up just in July. Um, also wanted to um, encourage you to attend our happy hour on Friday. That's tomorrow. You can register by today on the website. It's a, it's a really fun event. Um, if you become a member, you can get door prizes. Um, please come wearing your best costume, bring your own bottle. We are working jointly with the South Asian Bar. So it'll be a very festive event. That's tomorrow at 6.30. And if you wanna join it, register um, by today. Like tonight, I'd also like to thank a sponsorship, Big Apple Title. That's my company where I work for their support. Um, the Korean Lawyers of Greater New York. And I'd like to introduce, um, we're also working with the Nassau County Women's Bar Association. Uh, Irene Angelakis is the past president and I would just like for her to say hello, followed by Andrea Brody, the newly uh, inaugurated president of the bar. And we, we appreciate that they've been working with us on this event. Thank you, Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to say a really quick hello on uh, behalf of uh, both of, I'm, I'm going to turn it to Andrea in a few seconds, but um, I'd like to thank everybody for participating today. And I'd also like to encourage everybody to either renew or join um, the Nassau County Women's Bar. We've had a really great year and I know Andrea has some amazing things planned uh, as I currently sit on her board as well. Um, so I encourage everybody to join and participate. I'll turn it over Andrea. Andrea? Hi everyone, my name is Andrea Brody. I am the current president of the Nassau County Women's Bar Association. We're really happy to be co-sponsoring this event today, especially because our immediate past president, Irene Angelakis, is a panelist. Um, as everyone has said, we really encourage you to join our organization or renew your membership. You can renew online at www.nassauwomensbar.com. We have a number of programs planned throughout the summer and we certainly will to continue throughout the year. So we hopefully look forward to seeing everyone and I hope everyone is continuing to stay safe and healthy in these challenging times. Thank you, Andrea. We appreciate you joining us today. Um, is Gary Moret, uh, Moret available on behalf of the Queens County Bar Association? Okay, if not, then I will thank the Queens County Bar Association. He is the Dean of the Academy for also working with us in this event. Whistleman Law Firm is also a co-sponsor. That's Whistleman, Haranian, and Associates. Jackie Haranian, who's a powerhouse. We're gonna miss her today, but I know she is with us in spirit. Um, Jerry Whistleman, Derek Rubin um, are on the panel with us today. You'll get to see what amazing matrimonial lawyers they are. And I personally wanted to thank Linda Whistleman, Director of Marketing the Firm, for, for coordinating and helping us with everything that we did to get this off the ground. Um, Last but not least, my sponsor of many years, Flushing Bank. 
I want to thank them for their sponsorship and support. Normally, this was scheduled in March at their beautiful branch on Hillside Avenue, New Hyde Park. And because of social distancing, we have to do it this way. But I wanted to acknowledge uh, Smitha Khan, Michael Genova, and Maria Silva. I don't know whether they're available or not. So if they are, unmute yourselves and I'll give you a chance to say hello. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Hi everyone. There she you is. Hi, Smitha. Say a couple of Hi. words, all right? Nice to Thank see you. you. Good afternoon. You too. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Margaret mentioned, my name is Smitha Lukos Khan, and I'm the branch manager of the Flushing Bank located in New Hyde Park. Um, I hope everyone and their families are staying well and safe during these unprecedented times. Um, you know, Flushing Bank is excited to sponsor this seminar and our, com our continued partnership with Margaret and the AABA and uh, I do want to also thank uh, Jackie and uh, Jerome Wesselman, Irene Angelikas, and Derek Rubin for their collaboration and time today in reviewing this information. Uh, you know, Flushing Bank, you know, we're proud to continue sponsoring these events such as these educational cars and give back to the communities that we serve. For those of you who may not know, Flushing Bank has been serving the Metro New York and Long Island community for over 90 years. And we are a full service financial institution meeting both the need of our consumer and business. Um, so I want to thank everyone for their participation, and I look forward to getting no many more of you uh, in, in the future. Uh, I want to turn it over just for a quick moment to introduce my fellow colleague, uh, Branch Manager Michael Genova. Thank you. Thank you, Smitha. Thank you, Smitha. Hi, Margaret. Um, Hi, Michael. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Um, Michael Genova, Flushing Bank, as uh, Smitha said, Garden City Branch. Uh, we're really happy to be on this event today with our co-sponsors co and to see some familiar faces. Um, this is our first Zoom uh, CLE, so I think that's fantastic. It's exciting. Um, just a little bit to kind of echo what Smitha touched upon. Uh, Flushing Bank, you know, isn't your average bank uh, in the commercial, you know, arena these days. Uh, we really pride ourselves on service, on community, on education. Um, and please, if there's anything that you need, that your businesses need, colleagues, uh, family, even on the consumer or business side of banking, uh, we have teams that for us all in Long Island, New Hyde Park, Garden City, RxR. We're in Manhattan. We're also an expanding bank. We handle many legal accounts, estates, trusts, guardianships. We have streamlined account opening processes. So anything we can do to help you uh, we don't just want to be, you know, a bank on the corner. We want to really start a relationship, get to know you. So please, again, my name is Michael uh, Genova. Anything that you need, reach out to me directly. Connect with Margaret. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation or another Zoom in the future. Um, learn about you, learn about your business, and just make connections and, you know, finish the year strong, start a new one even stronger. So thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, stay well, stay safe, and um, looking forward to the agenda today. Thank you, Michael. We definitely will plan the next one every good up. And I want to say you look really cool today. I've never seen you out of a suit. It's a very good look. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Um, now I'm on to some administrative things. Some of you, your boxes are not showing your names, and we need for Sealy purposes to have your names. Uh, somebody has Barbara's iPad, or you might be using someone else's device. I need for you to use the chat bar on the bottom of your um, screen to send us your name and your email address uh, if you want to put your cell phone. Um, and we can, you know, this way get you your CLE certificates. Any questions you have during the course of this, because you will be as an attendee on mute, please put in the chat box. I will monitor that. Um, and we will be answering those questions at the end of the uh, program. The other thing is, uh, let's see, what else do we have? Okay, um, any questions? We're all gonna share uh, our contact information with you um, because we have a lot to talk about on such a very big topic. Feel free to reach out with the, to, any, to us for any questions at the end of this. I'm sure maybe we could even do part two because there's just so much to cover, but we'd want to give you a taste of the topic matter. Um, so let me read what I'm required to do for the Sealy uh, certificates as a housekeeping matter. And let's see what happened to my phone. The Asian American Bar Association of New York is certified by the New York State Continuing Legal Education Board as an accredited pro provider. This program has been approved in accordance with the requirements of the Sealy Board for a maximum of two credit hours in which one and a half credit hours will be applied towards the areas of professional 
practice requirements and one half credit will be applied towards the ethics and professionalism requirement. Transitional and non-transitional New York attorneys will receive credit for this program. He must have pre-registered and confirmed for this program to receive CLE credit. The first page of the written materials that were emailed to you is an attorney affirmation, which you must complete after this event and return to CLE at aabany.org. Two codes will be announced during this program. Record the codes on the attorney affirmation. Please return your affirmation as soon as possible within one week so that we can send you your certificate. You also received a link for an online evaluation for this session with the written materials. Please complete the evaluation so that we can improve our programs. The program is being recorded for those who are not able, unable to participate today. Your continued attendance in this program constitute your consent to transmit, record, and use your voice and image for this purpose. So basically make sure you listen for the codes and put it on the affirmation and get that back to us and fill out the evaluation form. Um, if you do have any questions, just put it in the chat room or make sure I get your contact information and then we'll follow up on this. Our first speaker for today, so I'm starting the program. You should put this, uh, no, not yet, hold on. Okay, at the 50 minute mark. Okay. The first speaker will be Derek Rubin of Whistleman Law Firm. I'm just gonna read his brief bio. He's a senior associate at Whistleman Haranian Associates, been in the firm since 1997, recognized as a New York Metro super lawyer for seven consecutive years. He not only does matrimonial, he does residential commercial real estate litigation, uh, estate, civil, civil, civil and criminal and corporate law. Hofstra JD 1984, uh, SUNY Binghamton Business School 1981, admitted New York State Bar, Eastern and Southern District. Uh, he's held public office in the village of Flower Hills, the former mayor, chairman of the Zoning Board of Appeals and a chairman of the planning board. Very well published, frequently lectures. Um, and we are delighted to have him here today to start off our program. Derek, here you go, you have the floor. Very good, thank you, Margaret. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're safe, healthy, and practicing social distancing. And I'm just thrilled not to be wearing this right now. Uh, in case anybody has a question about my topic today, you can email me at Derek, that is D-E-R-R-I-C-K, at law, L-A-W, jaw, J-A-W dot com. So today, my topic today addresses the issues of real estate in a divorce action and how same is adversely affected during COVID-19 and trying to sell real property. For example, I have a closing next week. My client is very fearful about going out of the house because of the coronavirus and he won't go get the deed notarized or acknowledged. Or won't sign any of the accuracy documents. As such, I'm going to have to resort to e-notarization through Zoom just to obtain those documents. And the closing, they want only necessary parties at the closing and flushing. So I'm gonna drop the papers off, sit in my car, wait for a phone call, tell me the checks are ready, and then I'll drop back. Okay, in a divorce action, normally the two biggest issues are who gets custody of the children and what to do about the family house. Today, we'll deal with that real estate headache. To many couples, the home's their greatest asset. They have equity in it, they have sentimental value, but there's an agonizing choice what to do with the real property and a divorce. Should they immediately sell the home? Should they delay the sale until the youngest is turns and starts attending college? Should one buy out the other's share? So let's first determine if both spouses are even entitled to share in the equity in the home in our divorce. For our non-matrimonial attorneys, a divorce action normally ends up with either the party's going to trial and the judge deciding and determining all the divorce related issues, or the parties enter into a separation agreement or what we know as a stipulation of settlement, which is a comprehensive agreement between the parties addressing the following major issues, maintenance and equitable distribution. Plus, if there are any children, it also covers custody, visitation and child support. The issue of the home falls under equitable distribution. So to determine if both spouses are entitled to share in the equity of the home, we need to ascertain is this house marital property or separate property? Separate property means one person owned the house prior to the marriage or received it as an inheritance or a gift during the marriage. In a divorce, marital property and not separate property is equitably shared. Now, now what do I mean by equitably shared? New York courts must divide the marital property 
property equitably. That means fairly, not necessarily equal. The court has 14 specific factors under domestic relations law section 236B5 to decide that. My favorite is the last factor, number 14, which states any other factor which the courts shall expressly find to be just and proper. Other means the judge has a lot of leeway and a lot of discretion in deciding equitable distribution. By the parties entering into a stipulation settlement, the court no longer makes a determination as to that fact. Now, when the parties enter into a stipulation settlement, they should address all house issues, which I will discuss shortly. So they... Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, Untitled the house. Uh, the house can be titled in one person's name, tenants in common, joint tenants, tenants by an entirety, the name of a corporation, LLC, or a trust. If the house is purchased after the marriage using marital funds, yet still titled just in one person's name, the house is mostly marital property and probably marital property. Now, in the old days, doctors wouldn't put the deed in their name because they're afraid of a malpractice money judgment lawsuit that would attach to the house. So that's why a deed in one person's name still would be marital property. Now, only if there's a tracing of separate property funds could there be proof that the property is actually separate property of one spouse. For example, Mrs. Jones, prior to her marriage to Mr. Smith, had $300,000 in her bank account from money she earned at her job. If after the marriage, the house is purchased solely in her name, and we can trace all $300,000 from that checking account right to the purchase of the home, that, that house properly, it, that property is in essence separate property, not subject to equitable distribution. Now, if Ms. Smith decides to add her name, add her husband's name to the deed after the marriage, this could be a donative intent by her to transform and transfer her husband's share in the home's equity. Thus, she's actually transformed separate property now into marital property. Sometimes one party is entitled to separate property credit on marital property. Once again, back to Mrs. Jones and Mr. Smith, they purchased the house together. Ms. Jones used $300,000 of her monies. The house is now worth $600,000 at the time of divorce. If she traces the money, she's entitled to a $300,000 credit off the top when that house is sold. Now, even if the house is separate property, there could be something called marital appreciation on separate property. That is where one spouse has so improved the separate property, the other to increase its value. For example, Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith owns the house prior to marriage. The house is worth $200,000. After marriage, her husband, a home improvement contractor, stalls a deck, a dormer, and some other work. The house now, when finished, is worth $300,000. Through the husband's sole efforts, the value of the house is increased by $100,000. The husband may be entitled to 50% of that $100,000 increase. Now, let's assume for today, the house's marital property purchased at marriage with no separate property credits. If the plan is to sell the home immediately, here are the benefits. One, bad memories. If the house harbors bad memories, such as the bedroom where your spouse had an affair, you might want to get rid of that house right away. Also, with satisfaction of liens, if the house gets sold, you can wipe out the encumbrances, such as a mortgage, a HELOC, or maybe some other judgments. Plus, if there's equity in the home, you can share in it. Plus, if you sell the home immediately, hopefully the parties will share in the transfer taxes for the seller. For example, if the house is in New York City, uh, if up to $500,000, it's 1%. Above 500, it's 1.425%. The state is four per thousand. So for example, a house sells for $800,000 in New York City, transfer taxes are 11,400 and the state's 3,200. With, if the house sold immediately, hopefully the sellers will split those expenses. Plus, there's a tax benefit of jointly selling the home. Uh, instead of one person buying out the other, uh, they might take advantage of the long-term capital gains that allows the parties to exclude up to $500,000 in profit. Uh, if one person owns the home, it's up to $200,000, up to $250,000. Now, to qualify for this exclusion, married taxpayers filing jointly for the year of sale may exclude up to $500,000 if A, one spouse owned the resident for at least two years during the five years prior to the sale, and B, both spouses used the residence as their principal residence for two years during the five year 
prior to the sale, and C, neither spouse used the exclusion in the prior two years. I know it's a little complicated. There's an attachment in the Dropbox. I gave you IRS publication 523, selling your home, and there's a section there addressing capital gains. There's also a number of scenarios where the divorcing couple, even though they're not filing separately, filing jointly, they can still qualify for it. Um, uh, such as uh, both spouse own the house together, or example, let's say one spouse owns the home but transfers the ownership to the other. Uh, the, the IRS regulations allow for tacking on ownership time period to qualify for the exclusion, or even if one spouse is awarded the home, uh, but the other still owns it, once again, time periods can be added together to qualify for that uh, $500,000 exclusion. Bottom line, ask your, the accountant, or check the IRS publication. Now, issues when selling the home and make sure to include all these problems in your stipulation settlement. One, realtor. Who do you pick as a realtor? The wife's friend, husband's? What price do you initially start at? And should you advertise the house as a divorce sale? I would never suggest that because uh, they might think you're out of desperation thus resulting in a lower price. Sometimes we put in our agreement that the selling price will be chosen by the average of two realtors pick one by each party. Uh, also, we put in the agreement that if you pick a, a price and the price is not selling, to reduce that price by 5% every 60 days until the price of the house can be sold. Now, sometimes you have a problem of the person in residence doesn't want to sell the house. Let's say, for example, uh, I had a case like this. The husband moved out, the wife's in the house, and they're trying to get the house to be sold. Husband wants the house sold immediately. So every time a prospective purchaser came over the house, the wife would take dog feces and put it oh, all over no. the house. She would also tell the purchasers about all the plumbing issues and problems with the neighbors. Thus, no purchasers actually wanted to buy the home. Uh, then you have the issue, let's assume the contract's signed, you're about ready to get the closing, and one party doesn't want to sign the deed, doesn't want to sign the actress, doesn't want to sign the transfer documents which is a case I have right now. Uh, what happens is you'll have to apply to the Supreme Court with an emergency order to show cause to seek uh, to have the person become the receiver in order to sign the deed, sign ACRA, sign transfer documents, and everything else to get the deal done. Uh, in, in that case, you probably have two attorneys on the case adding to the fees, but each attorney will be representing the interests of the parties. Uh, now, the benefits of a buyout, if the kids are young, possibly one person can stay in the same school district, be there with their friends, and stay there until the youngest heads off to college. Uh, also, if the market's no good to sell right now, uh, the spouse in the house can wait until the market conditions are better. Plus, if there's a buyout, there's only one attorney involved in the closing. Now, concerns in a buyout for both parties, once again, determining the value of the home. Don't use Zillow. Uh, you might use a realtor. The best is to get a real estate appraiser. It costs about $450, and that will provide your true value. Now, for the person who's going to get the house, you should be doing a house inspection, just like you would when you're buying the house. Make sure that there are no issues, such as plumbing, electrical. Check for termites. You might want to contact Margaret to get an attorney search title report from Big Apple Abstract. By getting that report, you can see if your husband, let's say that's the husband's the one out of the house, maybe he did a confession of judgment or he has some other liens on the property that you don't want to have when you buy the house. So it's very important to order that attorney search title report. See if all issues with the house. Let's say you put deck on the house with a building permit. Well, if, you, if you're trying to sell the house, that is going to come up. You might have to get a permit for it. Or if the deck is too close to the side yard, you might need a variance from the Board of Zoning Appeals. It might be all sorts of problems where you might have to take the deck down altogether. Things you should know. Now, money issues for the transfer E, the mortgage, even though your spouse is ordered to pay the mortgage and you're living there, but if he doesn't pay it, the bank's gonna default and the property will head off to foreclosure. Plus you got carrying charges to worry about. Um, remember winning sometimes in a divorce is everything, but sometimes winning the house and you can't afford it is not a great win. And then sometimes you have to buy out your, your other spouse and you have to obtain a HELOC. Sometimes parties don't qualify for the HELOC and therefore 
uh, the house then will eventually have to be sold. Now, issues for the transfer. If the transfer non-occupant is expecting equity from the sale, he's going to have to wait until that house is sold. Furthermore, if, if Weiss, let's say the wife's got the house and she can't get uh, refinanced, the husband's still liable on the mortgage and also affects him if he wants to apply for another mortgage because he already has a, a lien. Plus he has tax liability for the school, general village taxes. And then you might have the bigger problem of, let's say the house would be sold when the youngest turns 18. When the youngest turns 18, once again, the person in the house doesn't want to sell it. You've got to go back to court and compel the other side to comply with the agreement. Unfortunately, I've done this too many times. It probably takes 18 months to get this house sold by the time that the judge reviews the paperwork, issues a decision, talks about lowering the price, finds out that no one's complying, and then possibly orders the sale. But in a, that's in a nutshell what happens with a house. I see my time has almost expired. So Margaret, I throw it back to you. And Hi, I think Derek. I am so happy to meet you because we've been on emails and I like to say like Jones Rivers, can we talk? You've done an amazing job and I already can feel that we need to do part two. I know Irene's gonna smile and next time we need to have Jackie in the mix because this is a very sensitive topic and you've led me into what I'm gonna talk about which is war stories from the title world and you kind of gave a good precursor of it, okay? But thank you very much, Derek. I'm, I'm, very, I'm, very, I'm very pleased to meet you on such a, it's a very scary topic sometimes. I did see who's on. We have some matrimonial attorneys that are that are, are listening to this and they probably all agree. So I'm talking about divorce and title insurance issues in real estate transactions, okay? And they do come up. And my first remark was divorce proceedings are not always happy and amicable. They can be contentious. They could be war of the roses. Um, they're usually selling real estate as part of the settlement. This is not always easy to accomplish seamlessly, and the title company runs in the middle of it all the time, and we have to clear issues. And why do we have to clear issues? Because an innocent buyer is thinking they're getting a good deal out of a divorce sale, usually, and you know, and they want to they want to close quickly for some reason. And there's all kinds of obstacles. But remember what the title company does: we issue the buyer and the bank policies covering the chain of title is clean. There's no prior judgments, liens, mortgages. They're getting it free and clear of that. And that the people that are selling them the house, the divorced couple, or I'm gonna say the purported divorced couple, have authority to sell that house to them. And I'm gonna say that because I'm gonna talk about some of the war stories that I've had in my experience. Um, I will not talk about names. These are real cases, all right? And, and there are two instances where couples do get divorced and they still keep, as, 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 as Derek said, title is still in their name. For some reason, they didn't split the house up yet, okay? The one issue, as you know, and it comes along with COVID right now is because, you know, in the past, we would have couples come to closings and some of them would bring their girlfriends and the third party that was named as a party defendant in the lawsuit. We got a sea of lawyers, everyone's separating into conference rooms and everyone's fighting at the closing and, and, and they'd be fighting over pennies on the adjustments. Uh, and my, my innocent clients, if I'm a buyer, you're just sitting there and I go, was it worth all of this to buy this house? Because it's, it's, like a, it's like a nightmare. Right now we're dealing with COVID and social distancing. So we're dealing with a lot of remote closing. So I'm gonna talk about the power of attorney. So I'm sure that most of the attorneys know it. If you know you're gonna have a couple that's gonna be you know, upset at one another, get that power executed before everything starts rolling along. So you have it in your office the title company insists that we review this. And why? Because many times they're scribbled out. If we can't record a power of attorney in conjunction with the deed, the mortgage, and all the documents, the county clerk will reject all the documents going through. So if you're a buyer, that means your deed cannot get recorded. That is a treacherous situation. And then if we're going through a divorce, the couples might have separated and they're nowhere to be found to get a new one done. So power of attorney has to be in order. You use the New York form um, you know, if anyone needs to know what that is, you contact me. It's on, it's on a lot of the title websites, all right? And it has to have the durability clause. So in the event someone is disabled or deceased, the power will still be in, in full force and effect. So basically, it's the power of attorney. It's a document where one individual, the principal, gives another individual, the agent, the power to act in their name and place. All right, so the common issues are, we usually get it when the attorneys are not prepared at the table. And that is the worst time to get a power of attorney because it's usually not executed properly. The notary put, put notary in the wrong place. The name is wrong. 
one of the common issues is that when women separate, they start using their maiden name. And the power of attorney has their maiden name on it, Margaret Lang um, to Irene Smith, okay? She bought the house in her married name, Irene Angela Lacus. For title purposes, that's not gonna work. That will not convey title. I would need all the names on it. I can't write it in because I'd be tampering with the document and the county clerk's gonna reject it. It has to go back to the principal, Irene. She's gotta re-sign it. And if she's not in New York, that's gonna hold up, that's gonna really hold up a closing. So the minute the power comes in, I actually run to my recording desk and go, will this power make it through, all right? And that, that is the biggest issue. On, on women with various names, it's better to put AKA, put all the names, but the most important thing is the name on the power has to match the last deed. It seems so basic, but believe me, a lot of people forget what that's all about, okay? Um, also, the authority on a power. Uh, when you do powers, you might wanna just limit it to the transaction. You may not wanna give it broad overview to do a million different things because that's rather precarious. Um, check the notary, all right? Who's notarizing it? Did their notary stamp expired, all right? That's really, really important. And then at the closing, we're gonna get a full force and effect affidavit. We may ask the attorney, did you speak to your client? The best situations are where the attorney knows the client and is the agent on the power. You know, if it's an out of state signature, we have to make sure New York will take it. Is it the right form? And what if they're out of the country? You know, they got, they, they got divorced and one of the former spouses moved back to Asia or they moved back to Europe or they're not in New York anymore and they're selling the house. Got a power of attorney. You know, I get a call from the lawyer. So this is a true story. I got a call from a lawyer in a matrimonial and I said, okay, I need this notarized. You're federal, federal expressing a New York form over to the Middle East, all right? You need to go, and he said, do I need to go, um, do I need to go to the consulate? So if you are a member of the Hague Convention, if the country and you go on the um, htravel.state.gov uh, and look at the Hague Convention, if the country is a member of the Hague Convention, you can go to a local notary and get an apostille. Do not need to go to the consulate. The problem is the consulate's not always open at regular hours. What this gentleman told me is, and it was really amusing, I am not getting on my camel and riding days to get to the U.S. Council, Margaret. You're going to have to take it the way it is, and obviously I'm not going to take it the way it is. I looked him up and said, oh, you can go to the local guy so you won't have to ride that camel miles through the desert all the way to the council. Um, so an apostille is basically, and it's very fancy if you get it, it's a word, French word for certification. The local notary will take a look at it certified authenticity of signature. But the key to it is to make sure that country is a member of the Hague Convention. And I always suggest to call the title company to let them know where you're getting this from. If it is burdensome, it's easier for you. When they do it abroad, get a copy of it. You could shoot it on your phone and send it to the title company in New York to make sure that that power of attorney can be recorded because that is the bane of our existence is when you cannot get documents recorded. Question is though, some power of attorneys, we're automatically gonna reject it. If it, from the title company perspective, what we call self-serving power of attorneys. You know, sometimes it's just really easy. You know, your husband's a lawyer and you know, I wanna do a power, like, could you notarize this for me? So that's very self-serving, all right? So say the couple, two lawyers are getting a divorce and then they wanna give, Margaret wants to give her husband the power and then he's gonna notarize it. That's totally self-serving, that's totally, that's totally the agent, can't benefit from the power. You have to have a third party involved. And we do pick up on these things. The title companies, when we look at everything, we look at it with a magnifying glass. Sometimes I hand it to somebody else to look at, then it's kicked back to me. So we basically cannot take a deed from one spouse to the other with a power of attorney giving the grantee to be the agent. You need a third party. We would insist upon it. I've rejected them so many times. I would say it's best to have the attorney representing them uh, to be the agent, all right? So again, submit power of attorneys, and I'm gonna ask for identification too. I'm not just gonna take the power. I wanna see, is that the proper person that signed it? However, in this world of COVID, like Derek said, we will take pre-signed documents. We actually prefer to take pre-signed documents, all right? And basically at the closing, we'll um, make sure that we have someone attesting that whoever signed those documents, if it's in the sellers or, or the buyers, that uh, they have not changed their mind, they still consent, and if the attorney's willing, he will give us his attorney affirmation that it's in full force and effect, spoke to the clients and nothing's been changed. They still consent to the transfer and all the documents that are being submitted 
to the title company. And remember, I know it's straightforward. You know, lawyers. We I, I know here sometimes we don't we don't we don't give notarized affidavits. We give affirmations um, that were duly admitted and of current status in whatever department we're admitted in. Okay, so. Acris, I do know that Derek mentioned Acris documents, all right? It's best, and that's the problem, and, and he raised the issue that some people are refusing to sign them. We can't have that happen unless, as Derek said, you go to get a court order. It's best to have the title company that's probably representing the buyer do all your Acris documents. It just makes it easier in case there's changes and things have to be expedited. You don't have to worry for codes and length of time from another title company. Um, proof of identification. And I'm going to talk about this next. It seems straightforward that you ask for someone's driver's license or identification or passport. Um, and in the age of COVID, we have to really be careful because people are not in front of us right now. So we really need to know that there's no fraudery or fraud, the two apps going on in a transaction. So many times I've experienced in the last 15 years that parties are impersonated at the table, fraud taking place, individuals, you know, who they think they are, representing themselves or not, do they have the legal capacity authority to act? Are they entitled to act? We have to ask all these questions up front. And I know it gets personal sometimes, but again, if we ensure the transaction and the wrong person fraudulently conveyed, that's a claim. So closers have to be alert to it. Sometimes they'll even call the bank attorney um, and, to, and say, is everything going okay? All right, so here's a true file. It's case number one, the Chase Bank refinance file. All right, husband and wife are on title. Looks fine. Husband and wife are going for a $2 million refinance on their Upper East Side condo with JP Morgan Chase. No outstanding mortgage. Absent whatever fees are involved, they're going to net out almost $2 million. Title closer calls Margaret and says, Can I put the bank attorney on the phone? Something doesn't seem right. The husband seems really nervous and the wife is fidgeting. All right. Um, the wife's identification looks like it's a cut and paste passport. So I get on the phone and I calmly say, Mr. Smith, does your wife have any other identification? He blatantly says to me, when am I gonna get my checks? The answer is no, she has no other identification. And then he proceeds to admit to me that Mrs. Smith is in Switzerland on business and they are getting a divorce. Red flags all the way across the board. I said, well, when Mrs. Smith gets back from Switzerland, we can close in with her consent who was that with you there? And he said, it's my girlfriend. I said, it is your girlfriend with false identification of your wife's passport sitting at the table with $2 million checks being cut already and ready for you to go. No, closing adjourned, put the bank attorney on the phone. Basically, as a result of those things happening in 2010, which was 10 years ago, the New York State Domestic Relations Law Section 236 affected the title industry in terms of transactions. It basically says that at the commencement and during the matrimonial proceeds, plaintiff shall serve on defendant copy of the automatic orders with summons, which shall include that neither party shall sell, transfer, encumber, conceal, and sign, remove, or in any way dispose of without the consent of the other party in writing or by order of the court, any property, including but not limited to real estate, personal property, cash accounts, stocks, mutual funds, bank accounts, cars and boats individually or jointly held by the parties, except in the usual course of business for customary and usual household expenses or for reasonable attorneys in connection with this action. So basically you see this all the time, you know, while the other spouse is away in the course of the divorce, they're gonna to try to do whatever they can. This is pretty harsh, it's $2 million equity in, in, in their condo on the Upper East Side. Um, because of this, we take, an, we take, and you may not even notice, but in every, um, exception affidavit signed at a closing by a seller, there is a recital proof by affidavit required that the seller or the mortgager in the transaction being insured is not a party to any matrimonial action brought under DR section 236. So if Mr. Smith signed the affidavit, he would have committed committing fraud because he knew he was getting a divorce and he was alienating real property and equity without his wife knowing it. Um, basically, that was not a good thing. Um, I had another instance in Queens, I won't make the law firm, it's a big one in Forest Hills, where um, the wife went in to borrow half a million dollars. She was divorced, she really was divorced, but she was saying, um, she, let's see, she was divorced and she said that uh, husband had, let's see, I'm just trying to remember this one. Oh, she was already divorced, okay? 
uh, which basically meant the house, the house, she only had 50%, all right? She severed the tenant by the entirety. So she comes to the closing and she wants to get 100% equity out of the house, all right? Um, we found out at the closing that um, she wasn't divorced, basically. She was still married. There were a lot of judgments sitting on, on the file. And a lot of things came up as to her marital status. But to make a long story short, there were $500,000 in bank checks on the table. We're trying to clear title because she's not being straightforward and upfront about marital status with us. There's a guy at the table that's her boyfriend. I think she was trying to undermine her husband because she was still married and take half a million dollars. So in a heartbeat, it was five o'clock and this, this file made an article in the New York Post the next day while I was sitting at Stewart Title monitoring this and calling the police. Her boyfriend took the bank checks and ran across Queens Boulevard with bank documents trying to run away with the checks. Now, if anybody lives in Queens knows that it's really difficult to be scrambling across Queens Boulevard, the bank attorney that was on it actually ran out after him um, and grabbed him in the middle of Queens Boulevard and one of the islands and took the checks and the documents back. So what people won't do um, for money, all right? That's why I'm talking about this. Um, case number two is the zero deed where one spouse transfers to the other, okay? So the wife is selling the house and uh, the last deed is from husband and wife to wife. So basically a lot of times they will deed in, husband and wife go, we're gonna get a divorce, we'll give it to the wife, we'll uh, give you a zero deed, right? The lawyers execute the deed, husband's happy to walk away. The deed was less than a year old, all right? So now the wife is selling it, and then the buyer's title company finds tons of judgments, specifically against the husband. So she's sitting at the closing and you know I'm asking what about these husband's judgments do you have a divorce agreement that says you get it free and clear of his judgments do you have something that reconciles this there's tax warrants he didn't pay his income tax it was a lot of money all right she's well I got divorced I don't have any paperwork should be okay he's not with me anymore uh, all of a sudden and I insist on these kind of zero deeds where there's no consideration you know we raise exception to title report last deed is a zero non-consideration deed from the grantor to the grantee, proof must be provided from the grantor that they fully consented to transfer 100% interest in the, pro in the real property. And the deed was not executed with the intent to defraud creditors. Sometimes people do that, believe it or not. All right, and I kept calling the seller's attorney, I need clearance, I need a separation agreement, I need a divorce agreement, I need something that says she gets the house and something recited how these husband's judgments were addressed. Totally not clear. She starts, everyone's arguing with me and the poor buyer, their mortgage uh, was gonna, lo the lock-in rate was gonna, was gonna go that day, okay? They're gonna lose the lock-in rate, bank of German fees of $1,000, believe it or not. And I'm talking to everybody. And the title closer says to me, there's a male gentleman sitting at the closing table, awfully quiet. So that is why we asked the closers to identify every single person at the closing table. And I said, find out who that is. And the wife readily admitted, it is her husband. They are still married. She used divorce as an excuse to try to avoid the judgments, all right? And at that point, adjourned, and you gotta clean it all up, okay? That was where they were trying to use divorce as an excuse. Okay, case number three. This is a uh, wife is selling the home, claiming divorce from husband. Oh, this is a really good one, and this is really true. House in Queens. Wife is pregnant and trying to sell the house. Wife's lawyer is pushing me, like we gotta close tomorrow, and we're in a real hurry. She's divorced, husband moved to Greece. We don't know where the husband is, he's in Greece, all right? And she has no separation or divorce agreement, it got lost, and we really gotta close, okay? There's a big for sale sign on this house, and the, and the lawyer's calling me so anxious that I got a little suspicious, no more red flags, why does he care that she's pregnant and they gotta close so soon, all right? Well, turns out I get a call from another lawyer all right, and the lawyer is the husband's lawyer. Husband is coming back from Greece. They never got divorced, all right? And basically it was a small world. The lawyer that called me was a classmate of mine from New York Law School that I hadn't talked to in many years. He found out about the house because the neighbor called when they saw the for sale sign, okay? He, she tells me he'll agree to sign the deed as long as he gets 50% of the sale proceeds. So remember when she said, okay, that, the, that she was divorced, right? She's claiming, um, she's claiming that, you know, it's okay, he's gone, it's all mine now. Basically though, the last deed was in tenants by the entirety. If they were not divorced, that was not severed. You need both of them to sign to transfer 100% of the interest in the property. So obviously that one, they didn't all come to closing. They did sign off on it. 
but there were also ethical issues on this deed. It turned out that the seller's attorney admitted to me that he was a little disappointed that the husband showed back up from Greece, okay, um, because basically the child that's being carried by the seller is his child. He's having an affair with the seller. He shouldn't have even told me this. I felt like I wanted to call 45 Monroe Place uh, Appellate Division. All right, and, and basically that this was unethical, that he, he's got a relationship with the seller. So that's one instance. Um, and then case four is Mexican divorce. Husband and wife get a Mexican divorce, which means no jurisdiction. Divorce again, did not terminate the tenant by the entirety. Um, husband dies, remember he's still married to wife one, husband dies, and then he remarried. So wife two is trying to say, I got 50% because he got divorced, all right? And I got 50% of that house. And now I want to uh, sell that and make some money. And then I get the title report. And basically, um, basically what happened is wife number two was trying to sell her interest. And when we found out there was no divorce that gave her interest in the property. Wife number one got everything as a as a surviving tenant by the entirety because there was no divorce. They were technically legally still married. Okay, so that was a problem. I'm going to read all of you the next code that you should put down. It is code, and I'll read it twice. Put this on your uh, affirmation form. Attach small letters, A-T-T-A-C-H-256. Again, A-T-T-A-C-H-256. Put that on your affirmation form. That's the first code. All right. Case number five, and we're almost done. Last deed, husband and wife are zero. Husband and wife are divorced. Wife is selling with lots of judgments, not husbands. She's got the house and now she's gonna sell and hope to make a lot of money. She shows me the divorce agreement and the judgment that says she's got the real estate by a specific address. I'm fine with that. What do we do with her judgments? And she's trying to avoid the judgments and she's telling me I filed bankruptcy and the judgments are excused in a bankruptcy action. We do a bankruptcy, bankruptcy search and we do find that the wife was discharged in bankruptcy. The question is, is she excused as to selling a real property? And the answer is no. Bankruptcy only protects the wife debtor against personal liability for any of judgment creditors. It does not lift the liens of these judgments as to the real property. She has to clear them. So basically, if it's within a year, you go back to your bankruptcy attorney and under section 150 of the New York debtor creditor law, you get a motion in the court for an order directing that the judgments be marked discharged as to the real property. It's a piece of paper, like a set of judgment. You hand it to the title company and we use that to get it off the block and lot of the property. Not many people know about that. And it is awful because it really holds up closing sometimes when people keep trying to say, well, I paid $10,000 for a bankruptcy lawyer and why is it not just gone? No, it doesn't go away against the real property. Uh, case number six. Husband and wife, okay, still in title. The names, they separated. Uh, and it's something that Derek raised, all right? Wife, wife, husband and wife still in title. I would say under Cov, they may not have separated because some people are still living together under the last three months. They have no place to go. Some people have decided they want to quarantine together. But really what happens is when no one's paying the mortgage, all right, maybe they've got a little mortgage forbearance right now under Cov, but under normal circumstances, no one's paying the mortgage. No one's paying the real estate taxes because it's not a priority. No one's paying the landscaper. No one's paying anything. You have to worry that the mortgage is going to go into default and foreclosure. And then the house will be taken away and nobody gets anything. All right. The bank, many banks do not ask for real estate taxes. And what happens when that comes up? You haven't paid real estate taxes. There's a tax lien sale rearing around the bend. People have to know that many people don't know, but from a title perspective, tax governmental liens take prior to a mortgage. They're called super liens. What happens in those situations is the bank will go ahead and pay the real estate taxes. They do not want to lose the equity in the house. All right. But I know anyone on this panel would agree it's always a financial mess when it comes to these things because no one is paying anything. Transfer tax, Derek brought it up briefly. In New York and New York City, you pay transfer tax from the seller's end. All right. Um, people ask me, can we just, we did a zero deed. Can we just not pay transfer tax? Since 1995, and I've seen it many times, family and interfamily divorce and family transfers are taxable. 
1995, they realized they can make money on these things. And I tell any lawyer that's doing a transaction like this, you should advise the clients and you should also disclaim from yourself not to come back to you for liability. You may be subject to audit if you do not pay any transfer taxes. And it could take years for this to come around the bend for, the, for these governmental agencies to see the deed and say, wow, this should be audited. And then the sad part is in a divorce settlement, if they paid it jointly at the time, responsibility would have been shared. What about the innocent person that did get the house at the end of it all? Deadbeat former spouse is gone for years. He's the grantor, he's supposed to pay the taxes and he's gone. What's the point of view of the Department of Finance? They don't care. They want, they want the late penalties, they want the interest, they want the taxes. They will go after the grantee, whoever owns it. And that seems awfully unfair and it happens though, okay? The last thing I'm gonna say is title insurance. That's what I do. People say to me, do we still have title insurance after the deed is changed? And under TERSA, continuing coverage, section 28, if you purchase with your other spouse the fee policy, when one comes off the deed, the remaining spouse still has coverage, okay? So if you have any of those questions, just contact me. My email is mtling88 at gmail.com. And thank you for your time. Uh, next up is Irene. Let me just get her bio. Okay. Irene has a really nice bio, but I promised I wouldn't read the whole thing, but you guys should Google her because she has amazing experience in her field. She's a matrimony and family law attorney. She attended Hofstra University School of Law. Her JD is from 2007. In the early years of her career, uh, from 2009 to 14, she was a senior and staff attorney, then subsequent senior attorney with the Children's Law Center. Returned back to private practice in 2014 as associates with Schwartz and Szynski. And in October 2015, made the landmark decision, I'm going to say, to go out on her own, and I applaud her for that, in the private law firm of the law offices of Irene Angelakis, located in Garden City. Graduate of, uh, as I said, Hofstra, guest speaker, many CLEs, many law schools, many, um, many other activities. Uh, she serves as an arbitrator for the Nassau County Fee Dispute Resolution Program, pro bono attorney for the SAFE Center, which represents victims of domestic violence. She's a member of the Nassau Bar Association, Hellenics Lawyers Association, Nassau County Women's Bar Association, of which she was the previous president and just stepped down, and the New York State Bar Association Family Law Section. Um, again, she served as the president from 2019 to 20. I had the pleasure of meeting her at the Hellenic Lawyers Gala, of which we're both members of that wonderful organization. She has been selected to the New York Metro Super Lawyers Rising Stars in 2020. That's wonderful. And every year since 2016, she was named top 40 under 40 in 2017, 18, and 19 by the National Advocates. And in 2015, she was named the who's who of distinguished alumni by the Worldwide Association of Notable Alumni. And on that note, please welcome Irene Angela Kakis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, so this program originally, we were planning it for March 25th. And we were talking about real property disputes and avoiding them in matrimonial actions. And then everything happened and everything changed. And now we kind of shifted it and made it you know, how to avoid these disputes during the COVID-19 era. So the program that I had originally set up to speak about in, in this section, which is um, to, how to refinance and to do a buyout, and I was gonna talk about clauses to put in stipulations, that a lot of that stuff still remains true, but it's very, very different given everything that has taken place in the last three months. So I'm gonna try to focus a little bit on the standard clauses that should be in on a stipulation of settlement and all the problems that we now face, given COVID, given the, the courts, you know, how they've been restructured, given the market. So there, there's a lot here. And this is one area of matrimonial practice that's been hit really hard. The other obviously being, you know, custody and uh, parenting time. But with respect to real property matters, I'm just going to give a case of mine, really just to have a model that we're speaking about. Um, because I think it's really on point and I think it really highlights a lot of the issues and what's really been going on in the last three and a half months. So I represent a client, we're out in Suffolk County. They've been married for 30 years. They have three properties. Two are commercial mixed use properties and then you have the marital residence. Okay, so this was really all that they had. 
they were retired. They were going to split up these houses. We went in in February, having a couple of talks, really about, oh, when do we place it on the market? When is everybody able to move out? You know, does one person want to buy out the other? Really standard stuff. And then Armageddon, COVID-19 hits. Everything has changed. So now we have a situation where the husband who was running the, the, resident, the mixed use commercial properties is supposed to be paying maintenance from that income. And what happens now when the tenants stop paying? What happens until we get the houses sold? What do we put into our stipulations of settlement now? So I'm gonna start off with the refinance. So if in a typical refinance situation, they're refinancing the property to buy out the other spouse. This is why you would refinance. Otherwise you would go straight to the buyout. So we put in the stipulation of settlement that the spouse will have six months from the date of the stipulation. It doesn't have to be six months. Parties decide whatever the case is, but six months we would say is pretty typical. Uh, it's a good amount of time to get the refinance going. So we put in that they have six months to refinance and buy the other spouse out because we figure by the time that they give all their paperwork to the court, to the bank, the bank approves them. A lot of times in order to get approved for a refinance, you have to show your new income and your new income is your maintenance and your child support in addition to your job so that you could qualify for these new rates. We put that all in there. They do the, the application process. After they do the application process, there's a closing date set up. They have the buyout amount, the spouse shows up to the, uh, to the closing and we're all fine. We make sure that in our stipulation of settlement that we put really specific clauses. What happens if they can't get another rate? What happens after six months? Well, then after six months, then there, we might give the other spouse the right of first refusal to then buy them out. Or we might extend it by another three months if there is good faith shown or there's market forces or there's something. But all that is pretty much laid out there. Now you have COVID. So a lot of people have been taking advantage of the low interest rates and everybody's flocking to the banks to say, to lock down these new low interest rates. And now is a really great time to refinance. And a lot of people have been seeing it like that. My client in this particular case went from possibly wanting to refinance and buy the wife's interest out to saying, maybe a buyout is better for me and I mean, a selling, not a buyout, maybe selling the property is better for me because I don't know now that I could afford this mortgage with the refinance rates. So there's one type of shift like that that we're seeing in COVID where we went from a let's refinance and buy out the other side to no, 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 let's just sell. The other thing is incomes have changed. Somebody who had a job back in March was laid off, was furloughed, is collecting unemployment and is gonna go back in a few months. There's a lot of different structures. And now they're not able to get this refinance rate. So what we have been seeing a lot and what a lot of the, the judges have been saying is give them a little bit more time to refinance. If you're gonna to stick to that refinance option, give a little bit more time. You have to understand that this is a difficult time. We have virtual closings, we have virtual filings, we don't really know what's going on in the courts every day. A new executive order is coming out. A new administrative order is coming out. So we're seeing a little bit more flexibility and we're seeing a little bit more creativity with our stipulations of settlement and how we structure or refinance. So definitely one thing we need to look at when drafting clauses for a refinance is realistic timelines. If six months was realistic before and somebody lost their job, you might want to look to nine months or 12 months. Or if you had three months before, you might want to look to six months or nine months. You also want to call places. You want to call the bank. You want to call real estate brokers. You want to call title companies. You want to call the court that's on this case and schedule a conference call. You want to have open conversations with your adversary. You want to really look into every single aspect. You want to speak to a mortgage broker above all. What's going on there? What's changing? How is everything really formulating? What's the latest update? Because we are literally making this stuff up as we go along at this point, because there's no precedent. There's no, oh, I was gonna refinance and all of a sudden COVID hit. Let's check the case law, what it says on this. We don't have it. So when I'm drafting my stipulations, when I have people who are saying, okay, we're gonna take advantage of these rates, we wanna refinance, but I lost my job or 
my job is not that solid, I may lose my job. You want to make sure that in that stipulation of settlement, that you're putting carve outs for this and you're giving your clients some kind of an out because you don't want to bind your client to an unattainable standard or an unattainable timeline. So that's my first note on refinances and how you want to structure that in the stipulations. The next thing and possibly even har harder is selling the home. My client decides, okay, we're going to sell the home. He makes this decision, this decision around May. Now we call the real estate broker. What is the value of the house now? Has that changed? The appraisal that was there before and back to a note on refinances, if you're going to do a buyout, you want to look at what the house is worth now because the refi, the buyout amount that I had six months ago and what the house could be bought out for today are two different numbers. So you definitely want to look at that now given COVID and give it the market change. But if you're selling the house, you want to go to the real estate broker and you want to have a conversation with the real estate broker. That's all I've been doing for the last couple of months with all these houses that the couples are deciding to sell. We want to talk about virtual showings. This is the home that your client is living in potentially, or your client's spouse is living in. Social distancing. We're having everybody walk through the house. Speak to the real estate broker. Make sure that you are up to, up to date and up to knowledge with what the guidelines are for showing a house, for showing a property. There's one thing with the commercial property in this case that I have. He said, okay, yeah, whoever wants to go in, but you also have six tenants. So you have to coordinate with the tenants. You have to make sure that they're comfortable. Tenants aren't really about having their property being, you know, their apartment being shown on a good day. Now you're bringing in, somebody has to photograph the property. Somebody has to come in and see the property. People might want to bring in their engineer. You have all these people coming in and out of your house where before, and Derek had given the situation where a spouse was difficult. Now they're difficult and they could kind of get away with it because they're saying, I'm scared. I, this person's going to come into my house and I'm wearing a mask and a face shield and I have, I have a pre-existing condition or I, I'm immunosensitive. I, I can't, I can't have these people in my house. So you want to make sure that you look into all the avenues. You want to speak with that real, you want to speak with that real estate broker and have really candid conversations, mm -hmm. have a plan, make sure all the guidelines, all the executive orders, all the CDC guidelines, all the guidelines specific to showings are being followed. And you want to make sure that it's all in your agreement. The house will be shown at these times. People must abide by these guidelines, even though the broker has to abide by them under under law or else they'll be shut down. You also want to protect with it in your stipulation of settlement. You want to make sure that if a potential buyer comes into the home without a mask, there's a clause in your stipulation that says we could turn them away. They don't have to come in. So all these things have to be put in because you want to make sure above everything else that not only are you keeping your client protected with their rights and their obligations, but we're now in an era where we have to make sure that their physical safety is being protected. So these are new clauses that in March, had we presented this, nobody would have ever thought to put these in a stipulation of settlement, but they're absolutely mandatory now. So you wanna make sure that the real estate brokers showing of the, of the homes, whether it's a commercial property where you're subjecting your tenants to it, or whether it's in your own property where you're subjecting yourself and your spouse to it, that all the proper language is in there and that all the guidelines are being met. After that, now you also have, how do we reduce the price? How long do we have to move out? What are the procedures in moving out? When you sell a home and you divide personal effects in the house, bring movers in. That's another aspect. I had to put in a clause about who is the moving company? What safeguards? The spouse wanted to come in. They hadn't been living together for three months and she wanted to come in and make a list of all her personal effects. She wasn't social distancing the way my client was. She's been out on the town. I'm getting messages and pictures from her Facebook account where she's at a party, you know, in a group huddle with 12 people, nobody's wearing a mask, all with their white claw. It's a great time. And he's been locked down for three months because he's a cardiac patient. And now she wants to come in with her best friend because she might forget something and make a list. 
Normally, somebody comes in the house to make a list of their personal effects, not a problem. Now, my client is screaming on the phone, they're trying to kill me. So it's a very, very big difference. So you want to make sure that you add a clause about how the personal property is going to be detailed, how the walkthrough is going to happen, the masks, everything. And we don't necessarily have CDC guidelines for walkthroughs and marking of your personal property. So we have to get creative and make sure that we have that in our agreements. So that's another thing that we've been really adding in post COVID to make sure that everybody's protected. Then you have your other standard clauses that are still in play. If the house isn't sold by, we put it on the market on June 15th. If it's not sold by August 1st, what do we do? How much do we reduce the price by? What is the, you know, do we go to the broker's recommendation? Do we have an agreed amount beforehand that we're gonna reduce it by 2%? These are conversations you wanna have beforehand so that the sale goes smoothly. Repairs, that's another issue. If a repair is over, usually we put in agreements if a repair is over X amount and one person is living in the house and the other isn't, they both share in it. If it's under a certain amount because you're living in there and it's a standard repair under $500, you bear the cost on your own. Whatever the amount is, you wanna put in a clause for it. But again, with repairs, some post COVID language that we're now seeing in stipulations of settlement. Who's gonna do the repair? How are they gonna come into the house? The person who's still living in the house, they have the right to turn somebody away that's not following proper social distancing protocols, such as masks, such as, you know, what is the cleaning like gonna be after it? Is there gonna be a cleaning company? Now a cleaning company that comes in after certain construction is done that's deemed necessary to sell the property, you're not just having your random run of the mill cleaning person from down the block that has been coming all the years that you've lived in the house. You need now a special company that comes in with sp special masks and PPE and then disinfectant agents. You need all that in the agreement. So to avoid, again, like the, the title of our CLE, to avoid these kind of disputes, the best is to try as much as possible, given the ever-changing conditions that we're in, to try to foresee a lot of these social distancing, a lot of these invading each other's space type of scenarios and put the proper clauses in your agreement for that purpose. And this is really the trend. And as we go on and as we see these pitfalls, you know, we always learn by, by mistake. You know, we learn that, okay, this happened in this last case, this issue came, I'm never gonna let that happen again. We have to let it happen. You know, we have to plan for it in our stipulations going forward. But as this is all evolving, as this is all new, we really just have to try to think about all the different scenarios where our clients might have to come in contact with each other, with other offices, with other agencies, people are walking in and out of each other's homes, and try to make sure that in our agreement as much as possible, we put in the appropriate clauses to keep everybody safe, in addition to the standard clauses. So that I see is gonna be a lot of an issue from what we've, you know, when we put in these issues into our, into our agreements and we've taken them back, for the most part, adversaries have been really understanding as long as they see that it's not a backdoor method of trying to thwart a sale or put off a sale. Everybody's pretty much generally taking the attitude of, yes, we have to make sure everybody's comfortable. We have to make sure everybody's safe. And these, these little clauses haven't really sparked up much debate. But again, they have to be dra drafted in a way that it's not you know, we're trying to keep the sale and somebody's trying to stay in the house longer or things of that nature. And finally, I just want to give a small note on the right of first refusal. Um, a lot of times they can't decide. Buy out, refinance, they go back and forth. And we're seeing this a lot in the current situation where people don't really know what their future looks like to be able to determine which is better for them, a buyout or a refinance. A lot of people take the the attitude of the devil I know, I'll stay in this house, I know what my payments are, rather than taking 50% of the equity and trying to downsize to an apartment or buy a, a different house, they just don't know right now which is best for them because they don't know what their income is going to look like in a year, two years from now. People don't know, are we heading for a depression? Are we gonna be okay in September? Are we getting a second wave? There's so many unknowns. So what I've been seeing happened in the last couple of months in the cases where this came up was if there was going to be a forced sale, 
then the other spouse gets the right of first refusal Mr. Rowe? Uh, they're Mr. able Rowe? to the time. So that comes up a lot with the right of first refusal of allowing the other party to buy out. We're seeing that now. But the biggest note here is that the court can only force a sale after a trial. And unless equitable distribution has been determined, nobody's forcing the sale. And this is a big problem coming in now. I've had a lot of adversaries reach out and say, we're not gonna be in court for a while. They're telling us we're not having trials until the fall or the winter. So let's just put the house on the market and we'll keep the money in escrow and we'll figure it out then. For people who have somewhere to go to live, it's a great alternative. For others that don't, it's not. And it's often leaving parties in a situation where the house is kind of being stalled and kind of being left up on the shelf until it could be determined because nobody's gonna force a sale prior to a trial. And you, you can't force another party. And that's another big issue that we're seeing. So the biggest advice that I can give now for avoiding real property disputes, obviously try to settle. We have limited access to the courts. It's opening up more and more every day but if we don't agree, we're kind of in this lock where we have to end up at trial and trial is far out. So if you can reach a settlement, you wanna to try to do it and you wanna to try to keep, you can't be tone deaf at a time like this. You have to keep in mind what is going on with social distancing, safe practices, and make sure that you're protecting your clients, not only financially, but their health now as well. Wow. Thank you, Irene. Oh my goodness, we could just have, we've got more CLEs to come, but thank you because it's, it's, it's really helpful that you've given us all this relevant information with what we call um, the new norm. And it's even more difficult if something as delicate as, as matrimonial. Look, um, Irene's not done yet. She's gonna come back with ethics in a little bit. So we look forward to that. Um, next is Jerome Wesselman, who is the founding partner of Wesselman Heronian Associates. He's gonna be talking about asset protection and financial agreements. Um, he has been named best law firm by the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, he's also named as one of the best lawyers in New York by the Wall Street Journal and also named as top 100 New York Metro super lawyer. Um, he is a graduate of Brooklyn Law School, Queens College, New York University School of Law, attended the Master's of Law Program in Taxation. Very, um, very well published, very a teacher and a lecturer and um, we, are, we are happy to have him today uh, to join the conversation. Cherry? Okay. Okay. Is it on? Okay, the PowerPoint is up. Let's see where he is. I don't know how many of you have experienced this, but many clients when it comes to agreements um, think that you simply go pull an agreement off the shelf and in an hour or two you can settle all of their life's issues. Uh, but agreements in the matrimonial area can be quite uh, complicated. What, I, what I'd like to do today is uh, give a, a global overview of prenuptial and postnuptial agreements. Uh, the law allows parties to contract both before and during a marriage as to how financial matters will be dealt with. And in today's world, the use of prenuptial and postnuptial agreements has become Okay, are we back? Are we back? Yes. Yes, we're back. You're we're good, back. Jerry. You're back. Okay. okay, let me fix that. So in today's world, the use of prenuptial and postnuptial agreements has become 
quite popular. Now, prenuptial agreements are most prevalent, but there's been an upsurge in postnuptial agreements, which are generally used where the parties uh, wished to remain married, but are having financial disputes causing difficulty between them. For example, I recently had a case where the husband was spending close to $60,000 monthly to send his daughter from a prior marriage to an exclusive drug rehab center. And the wife was becoming concerned that her retirement would be affected by this. Otherwise, the marriage was stable. So they entered into a postnuptial agreement, splitting up their assets in a way that would not dilute her share of their assets going forward. Now, in most cases, the moneyed party will prepare the agreement for review by the less moneyed party to protect property rights, both current and future. Where the parties are married and have neither a prenuptial agreement or postnuptial agreement, and there is a divorce proceeding, the parties will resolve their issues where possible with a marital settlement agreement or otherwise called the divorce agreement. And if we could go back one slide, uh, there we go. Now, there's a picture of a pie. And I don't know if anybody's hungry, but it looks pretty good, right? Um, but this represents something that the pie has been made already. In the marital settlement agreement, you're dealing with how to split up assets and debts which have been accumulated during the marriage and to determine whether maintenance is payable to a party based on historical facts. The, the facts have already occurred and you're determining how to split up the pie. Now, with a prenuptial agreement, and you could go to the next slide here, uh, you need a crystal ball because you really don't know what's going to happen during the marriage in the future. So you really must think very carefully about what could happen and provide for many, many different variables. Most clients are quite surprised when they realize how important it is to think about all of this and to, to really try their best to provide for all the different possibilities that may occur during a marriage in the future, to the extent you can, because you really can't predict everything. But the more you can think about and the more you could provide for, the better agreement you're going to have. Now with postnuptial agreements, um, you have generally, you have like a mixture of a, a half-baked pie and then a, a speculative uh, future. In order for agreements to be upheld, they must be fair and reasonable and not unconscionable in their result. And while parties can agree to what may be called a bad bargain, uh, the results must be within some sense of reason. Otherwise, the court will consider setting aside the agreement. The agreements are meant to serve as a, a roadmap, if you will, as to how things will take place. And I, you know, I remember like years ago when you drove and you wanted to get somewhere, um, while you were driving, you'd pull out this map and you know, try to follow the roads to, to get you to your destination. Um, today, of course, we have GPS, so we don't have to worry about this. But the, the agreement serves as a roadmap, so you, you know kind of where you're going and, and what uh, things will affect other things. You can be very creative in establishing this roadmap, uh, and uh, you can, you know, it's, it's really a, a freedom of flexibility 
to be able to have that creativity. Now, generally speaking, agreements where both parties are represented by counsel and the agreement is properly executed will be upheld. But there are uh, situations where that may vary. There are uh, situations where a party refuses to be represented by counsel. And if that's the case, it's incumbent upon whatever lawyer is, is dealing with the other side to advise that party, they have the right to be represented, they should be represented, but if they continue to refuse, then you need to have them sign off on a letter that they've been advised to have representation and despite that advice, they're waiving that right. Now, transparency as to assets and income is critical. Each party must provide a financial statement describing in reasonable detail their assets and income with approximate values where possible. A lack of transparency in these agreements will raise serious issues as to the efficacy of the agreement. Sometimes you can't approximate the value of an asset. So at the very least, if you, if you can't do that, you want to set forth the name of the asset and some description. For example, if a party has an investment in a biotech company trying to produce a vaccine, it may have little value now and no value later, or it may have huge value later and may become the biggest asset of the marriage. So these things must be set forth and understood in the best way possible. Other issues can involve whether a party has been deceitful or not in inducing the other party to sign the agreement. In the case of Chiaffi Petrakis versus Petrakis, which I think you have in the materials, an action was brought to set aside a prenuptial agreement between the parties. The wife initially refused to sign the agreement, but then later, only four days before the wedding, she signed under a great deal of pressure. A number of factors were considered by the court in whether to set aside the agreement, including the following. The husband told her if she didn't sign the agreement, they wouldn't get married. The husband told the wife he would not marry her unless she was Greek Orthodox and raised their children in that tradition. And she thereafter embarked upon studying to do this and learn to speak and write the Greek language. The wife's family had already spent some $40,000 toward the wedding. And he also told the wife that anything they acquired during the marriage would be theirs. And after they had children, he would in fact tear up the agreement. And as I stated before, the agreement was signed only four days before the wedding uh, when the wife was under a great deal of pressure to sign. The lower court took, I'd say, a holistic viewpoint on all that occurred and found that the husband had no intention of tearing up the agreement and that he fraudulently induced the wife to sign the agreement and set it aside. And the appellate division in the second department affirmed that decision. And in the case of Petraca v. Petraca, which is also in the materials, the parties were married in December of 1995 and in March of 1996, they entered into a postnuptial agreement. The agreement provided that a jointly owned marital residence purchased for $3.1 million after the marriage and renovated for between three and $5 million thereafter was the husband's separate property. Also, the wife 
who was a homemaker at that time, waived her interest in the husband's businesses, including the appreciation of businesses during the marriage. And further, the wife waived any claim to the husband's estate, including any right to an elective share. At the trial, the wife testified the husband threatened if she didn't sign the agreement, they would not have any children and the marriage would be over. And the evidence in the case also showed that the husband had undervalued his net worth by nearly $11 million. The appellate division in that case affirmed the lower court decision setting aside the agreement emphasizing that because of the fiduciary relationship between the spouses, the agreement would be closely scrutinized and that the terms of the agreement were wholly unfair. Now there, there are two major areas involved in prenuptial and postnuptial agreements. One, what happens in the case of a dissolution of the marriage and the other is what happens in the case of a death of a party. Without these agreements, the law provides that all property accumulated during the marriage is marital and that a surviving spouse has a right of election. However, in these agreements, the parties can opt out of the law and make their own decisions on how things will take place. Many times I receive an agreement prepared by opposing counsel representing the moneyed party, which provides nothing or almost nothing to the non-moneyed party. And this is really the worst thing that an attorney can do for their client. Because the whole point here is to have an agreement a party can depend upon and will not be set aside. It is very important, as I indicated before, to look to the future possibilities the parties may experience. You should consider in these agreements the businesses the party or the parties have and or may become involved with whether there will be any kind of commingling or transmutation of property in the future. Now, transmutation of property involves generally adding the other spouse to title. So it changes it, the, the property from separate to marital property, which may be subject to a separate property credit, but it, it changes title. Commingling is really, uh, you don't change title, but there's a mixture of marital and separate assets that are, go together. So if you have a bank account uh, that was separate to begin with, but you put money that was earned during the marriage into that account, that's a commingling of funds. You should also consider whether uh, marital funds would be contributed to other separate property or whether a party will devote efforts working at the other party's business or contribute their separate property to the other separate property. You should consider whether the parties will have a family and how that would affect one's ability to work and their needs. Uh, you should consider what would happen in the case of a disability of a party and how long the parties remain married and how that will affect property and maintenance provisions. So if uh, parties are married five years uh, and uh, you have a certain distribution in 10 years, maybe it should be more. And then in 15 years and 20 years, and if the parties have had a family, uh, that's a, a pretty big, big investment of time in the marriage. So uh, the awards or the, the provisions should be greater and greater as the marriage goes on. And in some agreements, you may want to agree that the agreement terminate after a long period of time, maybe 20 or 25 years of marriage and raising a family. 
you also want to consider whether retirement benefits, uh, which are accrued during the marriage, should be separate or marital. Uh, if there's a waiver of entitlement by the lesser money spouse, will there be provisions for a distributive award uh, or a, spe a specific sum of money uh, to that less moneyed spouse? And also the length of marriage would affect how much that should be. And in the case of the death of a party, what provisions would there be? Would that depend upon whether there are children, substantial joint assets with survivorship rights, the length of the marriage? Would there be an estate waiver? And if so, will alternate arrangements be made for property distribution? And you're always looking at the, the length of the marriage to determine whether an award should be less or more. Will life insurance be provided to cover the survivors? <coughs> and very often, life insurance will be provided where the money parties... So these guys family. don't seem to wear masks. So when you go out there, keep your distance. They don't wear masks. <coughs> As I was saying, will life insurance be provided to cover the surviving spouse? Very often, it will be provided where the moneyed spouse is in the family business and the family would not want interference by the surviving spouse. In the case of a disability of a party, there may be a provision for trusts, including special needs trusts. I recently had a matter where the wife had a substantial progressive disability, and we used special needs and supplemental needs trusts to deposit maintenance payments uh, into the trust to avoid the denial of government benefits that she would otherwise be entitled to. So really the, the main goals of the agreement should be the following. Uh, to protect assets in the case of a divorce or death and to provide some reasonable degree of property distribution and support so that the agreement holds up when being scrutinized by a court. Now, I don't know about you, but I do like to sleep at night these days. And I would never want someone coming back to me and saying, why didn't you tell me to be a little bit more reasonable with this? So the, the darn agreement would be upheld. Now look where I am. And you know that's really an important concept here. And sometimes a client will say to me, what are you telling me to do? I don't want to give up that much. But I, I say, look, I, I mean, you're coming to me with the benefit of my experience over the years. I'm trying to give that to you so you can make an educated decision on what you do. And I'm advising you, even though it may be a little bit more than you would otherwise want to provide, that, that you can be assured that ultimately the agreement is going to hold water. Uh, so uh, th that's just a very important concept in these agreements that I think many attorneys don't uh, look at. But I think, it, you know, after looking at the cases and the cases we, I cited before, you see how important it is uh, to be reasonable with things. Uh, I also, uh, in the materials you have, I provided a, a table of contents, which I think if you can go to the next slide here. So just to give you an idea of you know, how the agreement may be set up, um, the consideration uh, may be the marriage or, or, uh, or remaining married, depending if it's a prenup or a postnup. Um, the preambles may include when the agreement was presented to the other spouse uh, so if it was a sufficient amount of time in advance, uh, maybe, you know, four months or so, uh, and they had time to really negotiate and had that opportunity, that's going to lend credence to the agreement. Um, the intention, uh, I usually try to put something in that the parties intend to opt out of the law. 
as otherwise provided and to apply the terms of this agreement in satisfaction of everything that they're entitled to. And a separate property of each party really needs to be uh, usually attached in a schedule and some discussion about what is going to be separate property in the future is important. For example, will businesses you start in the future be separate or will they be marital? Those things should be covered. Contributions to separate property uh, are important uh, because in the course of a marriage, many times marital property will be contributed towards other, to separate property and uh, efforts may be made towards increasing that separate property. So that you should have some understanding as to whether those contributions are going to be uh, credited back to the party, whether there's gonna be a recoupment claim or whether there's gonna be a percentage ownership of the property. Um, separate liabilities and marital liabilities uh, should be covered. Who's gonna be paying what and who should, uh, how finances during the marriage are gonna be covered that varies as the parties go along, but at least it sets some kind of basis to follow. Uh, next slide, please. So then you wanna get to what happens, uh, what the rights are upon dissolution of the marriage. Uh, you wanna define exactly what is marital property. Sometimes property held in, the, in one party's name is marital property, as I think Irene had mentioned. Um, and what happens, how do you dispose of the property, uh, whether there's a, a right of first refusal on the property, whether um, if you're talking about a primary residence, one party has the right to stay in the property until uh, the oldest child is emancipated, uh, that kind of thing. Now, if the one party is not entitled to some specific property, uh, sometimes uh, you can provide for uh, uh, a distributive share and uh, depending on the length of the marriage that should vary as I said before the more the time you marry the, the more money should be involved with that and the same in the maintenance area um, health insurance should be covered and a definition of, of a definition of what uh, the dissolution of the marriage is uh, is it the service of a summons is it a separation agreement, it is a, a judgment of divorce. It can vary, but that should be uh, discussed. And uh, slide seven, please. Could I just for a second, I need all of you to write the last code down. It's give GIV 949, again, GIV 949. And quickly, Christine, KG, and iPhone need to send your email and name to the chat box or you will not get a silly certificate. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then um, just a, a few more uh, things here. You can provide for what child support uh, it, it, the parties want it to be, but really the court ultimately will have the decision if there's a dispute on that. Um, you have the section on rights upon death, as I had discussed before, and what's gonna happen with uh, retirement benefits. The representation by legal counsel here, you really want to have a good explanation if one party doesn't have counsel that they were advised of that right and they're signing off on it. I have a, a, a place where they actually sign off on that in the agreement. Uh, and then just go to the next uh, page, please. Next slide. Okay. Uh, some of these are really you know, just general uh, uh, agreement terms. Uh, legal fee issue, it's usually not a good thing to provide that the lesser money spouse waives legal fees because the court does, wants everybody on an on a equal playing field. So um, I, I would advise, and again, over a client's objections many times, saying, I'm not gonna pay his or her counsel fees. Well, yes, you are. And it doesn't have to be an outrageous amount, but you know, something reasonable. And if you could just go to the last slide, please. 
Okay. So if there's going to be an automatic termination of the agreement, you, you have a provision in there for it. Then you go down, you have the Schedule A and B, which are the financial statements, which are critical in the agreement. And then we put an allocution affidavit at the end where a party repeats that they understand the um, agreement, that they've uh, asked their counsel uh, anything they don't understand, uh, they're not under the influence of alcohol or drugs uh, so that they uh, are, you know, have clear mind when they're signing the agreement. So I, I hope that gives a good uh, overview, uh, globally speaking, of these agreements. And uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to call me. I'll be happy to speak with you about it. And my email is jerry, J-E-R-R-Y, at lawjaw, L-A-W-J-A-W, dot com. So uh, thank you, uh, Margaret, and everybody. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed the presentation. Jerry, thank you so very much. Um, this, this could be a whole law school three credit course in itself, and, and I think you've enlightened many of us, and I really appreciate that you found the time. Thank you so much. Sure. Irene is now coming up to talk about ethics, I think, so everyone gets half a credit of ethics today. So thank you, Irene. Come on board. Okay, so um, I have a couple of topics to discuss under ethics. I'm going to just do a little bit. I'm going to break it up into four sections, the disclosure requirements, the matrimonial retainer agreements, fee disputes and fee arbitration and escrow issues. In your materials, you definitely got the matrimonial retainer agreement. I, I took different sections. Uh, it's not a complete uh, retainer agreement, but it's different sections and important clauses that you should definitely have in your retainer agreements if you're doing matrimonials and you have the, obviously you're gonna be dealing with real property disputes. And um, then in the materials, we have the forms from the OCA website for fee disputes with clients and fee dispute resolutions. And in that packet, you have the initial form that you have to fill out for a fee dispute resolution. Uh, conference to be held. So I'm going to just speak a little bit about that. Now, first to start off with disclosure. Disclosure is very important when dealing with real property in the context of matrimonials. In your standard discovery demands, you'll have everything that has to do with the real property. You're going to have to disclose liens. You're going to have to disclose mortgages, the equity, the statements, uh, any separate property claims, any anything really that has to do with the property. And I would urge everybody in their discovery demands to really be as specific as possible when requesting information. Because the other flip side of the coin is, I gave you everything you asked for, you didn't really ask for much, but I disclosed what you asked me for. So you want to definitely put in your discovery demands. You want copies of all mortgages, HELOCs, liens, judgments, mechanics liens, every type of encumbrance that could possibly be on the property. You want that disclosed to you. And you also wanna follow up and do your own due diligence by following up with the title company to also make sure, never rely on the other side's word for it, but putting it in the discovery demands is a really good place to start to get this information. You also want to know, especially if you're going to be selling a property, you want to know about the physical condition of the property. So asking about those types of things is also really important because these are things that could keep you from selling the property. So you want to ask about those things and you have to disclose these things. Then Derek said it, great advice, do not rely on Zillow. A lot of us quickly do a quick Zillow search just to have an idea. So when we're maybe doing a consult or when we're first speaking with our client, we could ask them, do you know how much is left on your mortgage or on your HELOC or on both? We do a quick Zillow search just to get an idea and give them some ballpark figures. But you don't negotiate off of ballpark figures. You wanna get a neutral court appointed evaluator if you're already in court to do the evaluation of the, the residence or of the property, whatever it may be. Or if you're trying to keep this out of court, we all know who the, the standard court, you know, appointed neutral evaluators are. If you don't know, calling the county and calling chambers and getting a list of people that they typically use is a really good way about, of going about it. And you want to get 
this valuation done. Luckily, when it comes to real estate appraisals, they're not really expensive. And what we like to also do in cases of appreciation, you want to get a historical valuation and a present day valuation. So you want to see if husband bought this property in 1997, was married in 2000, now in 2020, they're getting a divorce, but wife's dad was, you know, a construction kingpin and went in there and fixed everything up, plus marital money paid down this mortgage, she clearly has a claim. But what's the claim to? So that's why the historical valuation is really important. What was it worth on the day that they were married versus what is it worth today? And those are the two different valuations that you want to get. And of course, everybody has to comply with disclosure and discovery. And it's, you always want to be ethical. You want to be honest. You don't, no one case I say is worth it to, oh, don't report that, uh, you know, I gave my brother, uh, you know, $20,000 lien on the house or anything of that nature. Whatever information you have, you have to turn it over. Disclosure is a mandatory, not a, not a perspective <laughs> when we're dealing with matrimonials. Um, the next thing I want to just move to, um, I'm going to get to retainer agreements and fee dispute resolutions. I'm going to just kind of clump those in together because they interplay a little bit. But when we talk about escrow, so in your stipulation of settlement, you want to be very clear. If the parties are going to sell the house and the money's going to go into escrow until some future event, or if the, the parties came to you and said, the house is already on the market, we're going to closing, we've agreed to sell it, but we haven't figured out anything with the matrimonial yet. Sometimes we get it, we come in as the attorneys in a little bit of a later stage and we say, okay, well, we need to keep the money into escrow until we could divide it until we have a stipulation of settlement. Whatever the case may be, the written agreement for escrow has to be crystal clear. You have to say, I'm appointing Margaret as the escrow agent Margaret is going to take the $500,000 net proceeds. She's going to hold it in her escrow until further agreement. Then the further agreement, we acknowledge that Margaret has the sale, the, the proceeds of the sale in her escrow. This is what we're going to do with it. The wife is going to get 270,000. The husband is going to get 230,000 the escrow agent is hereby authorized to issue the checks within, you know, give the exact date, give the exact amounts within one of with time frames, whatever it is, it has to be spelled out because the escrow agent needs to keep this. If you're the escrow agent, you need to keep this on file because you are subject to an audit at all times. And you want to be able to have the agreement that authorized you how to handle these funds. It is very critical. A lot, of, a lot of attorneys will say, I'm not even putting it into my escrow because they don't even want to touch it. They don't even want to get involved. They hear the word escrow and they freak out. But if you're going to be the escrow agent, that's it. You have to have everything spelled out in that agreement. When are you getting that money? What are you doing with it? How long are you keeping it? What's the next step? And you cannot do anything outside of that clear agreement. If they say, I had a situation where I was the escrow agent so a stipulation of settlement was done. The judgment of divorce was done. They were supposed to get the money 50-50. Husband owed wife $20,000 in counsel fees and said, Irene, can you do me a favor? Give her the 270 and give me the 230 and we're good. Nope. That's not what the agreement said. That is not what I'm authorized to do. You need a separate stipulation get it so ordered because that's what the stipulation of settlement said. If there's any modifications to this tip, it has to be done in the same manner as this agreement was executed, which was for it to be so ordered. So you go back, you get the authorization to do it that way and that's it. Or you cut the two separate checks and let them disperse it at the time, but do not stray the course of what is in that stipulation, what you are authorized to do as the escrow agreement. It is a very commonly made mistake. It is something that it just seems, you know, it's, it's a quick, let's just get this done. Yeah, they all agree. I have an email from my adversary if it ever comes up. It's just not a shortcut you wanna take. Never take any shortcuts with escrow agreements and 
if there's one thing that you learned from today, that's it. So the next thing uh, I want to talk about are retainer agreements and fee disputes. So I gave you different paragraphs in the handouts of sample clauses that should be in a retainer agreement. And they're all, they all have to do with handling of real property in a matrimonial. The first one is out-of-pocket costs and disbursements. This is a really important clause for us attorneys to protect ourselves against the following argument. I gave you a $7,500 retainer and now you want $500 for the appraisal? It's in the money, I still have a balance with you. This clause specifically says, these are your out-of-pocket disbursements, this is something separate, you have to pay for that. This is not me doing the work, this is not included in your retainer. It seems really simple, but very often I have to turn to this clause, whether it's the purchase of an index fee, the RJI, any appraisals, quadros, anything, you want this clause in there. The next is the security interest clause. And this is really important because after long treacherous divorces, chances are not only do people owe each other child support and maintenance and all sorts of arrears, but the attorneys are owed money. And you wanna be able to seek a security interest off of a property when it is sold. And this clause gives you the vehicle to do that. And they've already agreed to it. The next thing is under what circumstances would you be able to withdraw from the case from non-payment of fees and then to get a charging lien? You also wanna have this clause in there. Again, same reasons as before. You wanna be able to protect yourself. Then the right to seek, well, I'm just gonna skip over the right to seek arbitration because I want that to flow into the actual arbitration, but the retention of experts. So retention of experts, again, this is a very specific clause which works with out-of-pocket disbursements that you, in order for us to properly protect your interests, we're gonna have to get the help of certain experts. I can't tell you what your house is worth. I'm not looking at Zillow and relying on that number. I need an expert to come in. And that's what this explains to the client that these are the types of resources that we're gonna need to pull in order to get them a fair and equitable resolution, in order for them to be fully informed, in order for there to be full disclosure and in order for them to make an informed decision when they're trading off assets, deciding on buyouts versus uh, selling the, the property. This has to be in there for that reason. And it, like I said, it works with the out-of-pocket disbursements section. Then certifications. We are required as attorneys to certify court papers. And this is really important in working with your clients about real property and about disclosure. And it's a talk that I often have to have with my clients. I, as an attorney, am certifying certain statements are true. I am making certain certifications when we enter into these agreements, when I present a submission packet. For the non-matrimonial attorneys, a submission packet is, at the end of the day, when the divorce is done, there's a whole packet of documents that needs to be submitted to the court so they could sign off on the final document, the judgment of divorce, which permanently severs the marriage. And in those documents, we're making certifications that this is the result of true and honest negotiations, that this is the result of proper disclosure. And if disclosure has been waived, that we've explained to our client what it is that they're waiving and why it is that they're waiving it and what they're getting in return for waiving certain things. And that if we have provided information to our adversaries or have received information, that has been to our knowledge accurate. So we tell our clients in this retainer agreement that we're making certain certifications. You have to be honest with us. We're counting on your honesty. We're counting on your disclosure because we're making these certifications. And if you are not honest or we have some kind of a breakdown in these communications, then we can seek to withdraw from your case based on not keeping that level of candor. Now going to the right to seek arbitration. What happens when your client doesn't pay you? as is the case in a lot of these matrimonial cases that are really that are really overly litigated. There's always some kind of a balance. And most of the times we could figure it out, but there is a good amount of time that we can't. So we have the right to seek arbitration. And by putting this clause in your retainer agreement, you can take that route. So the arbitration program, I, first, I currently serve as an arbitrator in Nassau County, so I could speak to how it goes in Nassau County 
you would fill out the forms. I've, pro I've provided the forms in the uh, handouts, as I mentioned before, and you basically state, you fill it out. It's a one or two page form where you fill out how much is owed to you, the, the biographical information of everybody involved, names, uh, dates of the case. You have to have your retainer agreement. Make sure you always have an original copy of your retainer agreement that you keep accurate bills. A lot of times people have done the work and they have not kept accurate and clean bills. They have not billed their client every 60 days pursuant to the rules and they get monies deducted from real money that they actually worked because they haven't maintained accurate and appropriate records. So keeping those billing statements, making sure that you're billing appropriately and that you have a copy of your retainer agreement is a must for fee dispute resolutions. And it is the most commonly made mistake by practitioners. And then it really is a shame because like I said, most of the time, the client will come into a fee dispute resolution meeting and their complaint is not that the work wasn't done, but that they weren't happy with the work. And that is a very different argument. And the only thing that we're allowed to dock money off of or try to settle out something on that is if the work wasn't done or wasn't built properly. If they're not happy with the result, but the work was actually done, it's not for fee dispute resolution. It's a completely different argument and not within the scope of the arbitrators. So when they come to us, what we're looking for, did you, did you appropriately bill the way you're supposed to? Did you mark the amount of time? Was the client billed the way they were supposed to be billed and given the notice that they were supposed to within every 60 days? And were they billed for things as spelled out in the retainer agreement? These are the main things. So you need your retainer agreement, you need your bills, and you wanna make sure that you're specific on your billing statements, that the amount of time isn't excessive or egregious, obviously, that you're billing. And this is the key to a successful fee dispute resolution in your favor as the attorney. So you fill out the form and you're supposed to write, uh, attorneys have submitted various different ways of doing this, but really what the fee dispute is over, I billed them, they didn't respond, here are a copy of the bills, here's a copy of the retainer, the billing was appropriate, I'd like to set up uh, a meeting. We get it. If, if the amount in dispute is over $10,000, you have a panel of three arbitrators. One of the arbitrators doesn't have to be an attorney. The lead arbitrator has to be an attorney. If then it's under $10,000, you get one arbitrator who is an attorney. In Nassau, they're really good about having the arbitrators be in the matrimonial field because it is very case specific and it is very important to understand kind of the tone and the type of work that they're discussing, especially when somebody's going to claim that writing an affidavit four hours is egregious, but if you're in the field, you know that it could really take four hours. So they really try to make sure that, and I, I don't think I've ever had an arbitration with an attorney that wasn't a matrimonial attorney when we're doing matrimonial fee disputes. This is really, again, I cannot stress, I know I've been saying it over and over and over again, but accurate records is everything. It's everything. It helps protect you. It helps protect the work that you've done, the time that you've invested and the money that you've actually earned. And you do not want to get docked because of a clerical error, because you didn't send out your bills on time, because you didn't keep a copy of your retainer agreement, or because your retainer agreement didn't outline properly the things that you would be billing for. So you want to make sure in your retainer agreement that you're properly listing down the things that you'll bill for. I've seen attorneys be super specific to the point where they'll say, or they put in minimums. If you're going to call me, it's a phone call. It's a minimum of a 0.2 billing. That's clearly out there in the retainer. The client signed up for it. The client knew. If you're going to have multiple people working on a case, you want to designate what their billing rates are the principal who's going to be working on your case, partners, for example, they'll charge $500 an hour, associates of the firm, $375 an hour, paralegals, $125, uh, law clerks, $100, whatever the case may be, you break it down and you put it in there specifically so that there's full disclosure, the client signed off, there's nothing hidden, and these are the typical arguments that you hear, and you want to make sure that you stay ahead of those arguments by having the proper work. 
put into the retainer agreement and obviously the billing statements each month or every other month as the case may be, but within the rules. And that's, that's it. I do see a question actually that just came through. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just want to, because it's, it's to my topic and it's from Jill Stone and it says, because of the electronic filing now, do you know if we can charge a service fee if we use a credit card to buy index numbers, et cetera, even if we get the money for, from the client for fees, if we use a credit card, then we get charged. I had actually looked into this a couple of months ago, just in general about credit card fees, because a lot of firms right now are using credit cards to take in their retainers. So if you're getting a $7,500 to $10,000 retainer and there's a 3% plus fee, it racks up. Plus now we're paying for everything online, mandatory before we have the option. So this is really coming up as an issue. There hasn't been any new orders that have been issued that specifically give us as attorneys the ability to do that, that I haven't seen anything like that come through. If anybody knows any different, please feel free to correct me. But I, what I understand is that this is more, this is more of rules that have to do directly with the credit card companies. And what I would do is I would reach out to the credit card companies to see if they've had any differences. But when I had reached out to them several months ago, they had um, from the, the team at law pay actually had said that there are certain practitioners that put it in their retainer agreements. And they say, if you're going to use a credit card, this is the amount of the fee, but it was, it was really back and forth. It was a little bit of a gray area. So I personally wasn't comfortable doing it. I opened this kind of up to the floor if anybody has a different experience. Um, but I know that if there is going to be any kind of charge whatsoever, it has to be listed in the retainer agreement. And so with that, I'm just going to end with, if anybody has any questions about anything that we spoke about today, or about another one of my shameless plugs to join the Nassau County Women's Bar Association at nassauwomensbar.com. <laughs> please, please feel free to contact me. My email is irene, I-R-E-N-E, -E, at aalawoffices.com or at my office at 516-354-5656. Thank you to Margaret. Thank you to this incredible panel, Jerome, to... Derek, Margaret, of course, again, um, it's been a pleasure working with you. Thank you, Irene. It's been a pleasure. So everybody knows I sit on the network of our leaders. So these are all my colleagues. I am thoroughly impressed to my panel that our participants, very little people have left. And it's hard for this amount of two hours. So kudos and applause to all of Jerry, to Derek, to Irene, a little bit to myself for holding down all the participants. I think it's a really, really good topic. Um, I'm just looking to see if there's anything in the chat room. Good, good, good responses. We were awesome and we did a great job, great program. So that means we should do this again with updated information along the way. Um, everybody that's listening, feel free to reach out to us, fill out those evaluations and write down your suggestions. We're very interested in hearing from you. And I think webinars are good because it's accessible um, to everybody. Uh, and I wanna wish everybody a nice day and thank all of you for coming in on a sunny afternoon to listen to us on this really important topic. So everybody have a great day and uh, hope to see everybody soon on our Zoom rooms. Thanks again, thank have a good you. one. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, yeah. bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Are we good? Okay. Bing.